Excuse me, mate. Great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who is Yossi Pakkanen, and he works on the Meson project. Did I say that right? And his talk is on behind and under the scenes of the Meson build system. Please welcome Yossi. G'day. Um, that's a little of my Australian, so that's kind of like, but, um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, stuff that we found uh, in the Meson build system, different sorts of um, surprising things that, that happen when you have a, a bit longer running project. Um, but first, I'd like to say a few words about LCA. Um, I've done a lot of conferences, and LCA is my favorite conference, like off them all. And, uh, for like, certain personal reasons, and also because LCA was the first conference that accepted my talk. <laughs> so it's entirely possible that if they hadn't accepted, the entire project wouldn't exist. Um, so therefore, it gives me great pleasure to, to introduce again something new for the first time ever, which is a full manual for the Mason build system, which is oh, thank you, uh, 299 pages, um, which is both a, a usage manual and a reference manual, and this, uh, the text is more extensive than the one on the website. And this is all written from scratch, so there's no reuse of the existing documentation. And this is only available as a PDF to save trees, uh, and it's only available as direct purchase, and it's not in any bookstores or the like. Uh, and here's the website. You can go there. You can uh, buy it now. I pushed it to production about 20 minutes ago, so it should be there. Um, it doesn't have HTTPS because the hosting service has some problem enabling uh, HTTPS, but um, it should be enabled shortly. Now, the obvious follow-up question to this is, what if you hate blocks? Uh, and if you do, um, the, in Mesa we don't have a Patreon or something like, because uh, due to reasons it's almost impossible to run a Patreon for a, a thing of the public good. Um, so. Uh, if, if we feel that, uh, that the Mesen build system has improved your life uh, to the tune of $29.95 uh, plus a tax that depends on the country of purchase, it's, you're totally fine, you can buy the book and not read it. <laughs> so onwards, the actual presentation. Let's start this with a uh, simple programming challenge or design challenge. Suppose you have some data and you need to insert that into an SQLite database and some of the data that you insert should be up converted to uppercase. So how do you do this? Do you do A? So you have your data in your programming language, you do the conversion, and then you do the insert. Now option two, yeah, SQLite has a function for this, so it's an uppercase function, and you can use that in your SQL, SQL commands to do the things that you want to do, right? Or do you go for option C, which goes like this. You get SQLite's source code, then you add a global variable to it, which is called uppercaseify. Uh, and then whenever you do insertions in the database inside of SQLite code, you check for this with using get env. And then when you insert data, you set the global variable, then you call into SQLite, and then you unset the global variable. And then you set, submit a patch upstream to add this to the, the upstream repo. So show of hands, how many would you would choose option C? Not a single joke vote in the audience. Okay, well, well, obviously. But for some reason, this is the way people want command line tools to work. Every single time there's like any sort of uh, data through the things, they're like, hey, could we add environment variables to this? And it's like, no, no. Um, so if you look at uh, software engineering, and think of your favorite two anti-patterns that you have, uh, like the top two are uh, global variables and string typing. And environment variables are both. And, and yet, for some reason, people want these. And, and trying to support uh, like configuration with environment variables is just terrible, because there's no guarantee that they stay the same. They can change at any time. And, and, and So this, this gives rise to what's, what's known as the, the law of bad solutions. So if you have a bad, only thing worse than having a problem is that you have a bad solution to your problem because then the bad solution will prevent a good solution from being adopted. And there are a bunch of these, these around. Uh, one of them is compilation flags. We all of them all use them. Um, but have you ever thought about how you would combine them? So suppose you have some compiler flags that come from source A, 
and some compiler files that come from source P, and they tell you to do something. So how would you combine them? So do you do a global argument first, the local one? Do you do A or B, depending on whether you want to do something else? Or do you do A and B at the same time? And to no surprise to anyone, the answer is, of course, D. Because most compiler flags have write precedence, but some have left precedence. So in some cases, the one that comes first is the one that decides what happens. But in other cases, the one that comes last decides what happens. And then if you, if you have this problem, then you need to have all sorts of magic, like what are these compiler flags actually trying to do in order to actually make them work together? And this is a, an altogether terrible idea. Um, and configuration by compiler arguments doesn't really work because they don't compose. If you have only one source of compiler flags, everything is fine. But when you have more than one, then things get problematic. And they usually work. And the problem is that then at some point they fail in some weird way and you have an interesting debugging session in your hands. Um, okay. So some other, other things, uh, interesting, fun things that happen is that, as an example for the, the D programming language, which is uh, used quite a lot, there are three different compilers for this. So there's DMD, which is the reference implementation, there's GDC, there's LDC, which is based on LLVM, and they all take different compiler flags. Like, not like slightly different, completely different. Um, then all further on Windows, it would, to do the link, the uh, DMD reference compiler might use the Visual Studio linker or, or Clang CL's linker uh, or its own linker. And the first and third of these have the same name. It's link.exe. So if, what if you want to use both of them at the same time? Maybe something happens. Like this might work, your compilation might work if you run it on this terminal, but doesn't if you do it in this one, because the order of things in path is different, so you get different results. Um, right, so if, if you want to mix both of them with decode, how do you do that? Because there's, things might break. But it gets better, always better. Um, so if you want to use linker flags with GDC, um, as an example, how you would set the SO name. Uh, here, so you, you, this is exactly the same as you would do if you're using GCC. Uh, but for LDC, the syntax is different. It looks like this. So uh, um, I don't know what the correct solution to this problem is, but I can pro tell it's, that's probably not it. Like dash L, dash L, like what's happening? And this is also a problem is that every now and then uh, we run into people who, who are of the opinion that build systems, like they should just take everything that they, they define all the flags and then they just, just use them. Now, and the, the follow up question is like, if you are this person, is this a sort of thing like maintenance burden that you want to take on? Because you have to know all the quirks of all possible things to make things work. Is that, is that the, really the thing you want to spend your life on? I have spent some of, time of my life on it, and I wish I didn't. But, but if, if you want to do it, don't, don't do it even then. Um, and then it gets even more fun, um, because uh, there are lots of people who, who compile their, uh, like compile open source code for different purposes. Uh, as an example, there is a major organization doing security, and they, they compile many OSS projects with address sanitizer to find bugs. Um, the way they do that is that they inject compiler and linker flags uh, using environment variables, which uh, are the official way to do things. And this, this, this is how like Debian packaging and so on works. Um, and when you have external compilation flags, then you use them for testing, because um, when you test the compiler to do different things, and you have a flag that's always used, then you, need to, you also use it in the test. And then the test compilation fails, because among other things, they inject flags that change the way linker sim symbol lookup works. 
It's like, if they're missing symbols, that's totally fine. And then if you have a test, so like, is this symbol available? You always get a pass because someone has switched off the part where you actually get the correct results. Um, so um, we had a chat about this in a, in a bug tracker with, with one of the people in, in charge of this thing. And it went roughly like this. So the, you're injecting all of these flags and, and you are breaking things. So could, could you please not do that? And it's like, no, we need to do this because we need to compile with that risk sanitizer, which is a reasonable reply. Says, well, we have built-in functionality. There's a toggle switch that's like enable address sanitizer, and this is what upstream uses, and, and this is what everyone else uses. So like, just use the thing that we already have. Don't try to reinvent that. And then the answer that they gave back went roughly like this. I don't want to do that. I want to do this. This already works for every other Makefile-based thing in the world, so you should change your system so that it works with this. And it's like, well, how do you respond to that? It's like, we have the correct solution, but you want to do the wrong thing. Um, I don't know. But, but what this then turned out is that, um, have you ever considered like, where does software complexity come from? Why is everything incredibly complicated when it should be simple? And then the answer is, or like one of the answers, is that people have the opinion that if, if there's an obvious solution, and there's, like, there's one way to do it, then mandating that is a good thing. We should do that because that reduces burden and, and it's, it's shared across all processes, projects, and it works just fine. Except the weird non-standard thing that I personally am doing, that must be allowed and that must be supported from now into eternity. And this is where, and then this is where complexity comes from because people want to do their own things, even when it might not make that much sense. Okay, there are legitimate cases where sometimes you need to do something a bit weird, um, and that's, that's fine, but most of the cases when this happens, that's not actually the case. Um, okay, but enough about uh, compiler flags and stuff. Let's go on with the dependencies. Um, how many people here are software developers? Two, or, or just all asleep. Okay, so, uh, Package config is used for dependencies, and, and we all use that for all of our dependencies, right? Yes, no, maybe, okay. Um, well, package config is used a lot, and it's, it works for what it does, it's quite nice. Um, but there are many projects who, who don't use package config, and instead they roll their own. Um, it, it might amuse you to actually go and find out the reasons. Sometimes you'll write their reasons. It's like, I do not use package config because X. And they are all, every single one of them is always completely wrong. But all of these things have one thing in common. Can anyone guess what it is? They don't work. Um, there are surprisingly many things that you need to handle in your own whole, whole hand-rolled dependency system if you want, want it to be actually usable by many people. For example, does your thing handle cross-compilation? Probably not. Does it handle installing into custom prefixes? Probably not. Does it handle the file system layout on a Mac, which is different from the one on a general purpose Unix? Probably not. Does it support both shared and static linking of your libraries? Probably not. Does it support the Visual Studio compiler flag syntax? Probably not. Does it support platforms where the Unix shell is not available? 99% of these things are shell scripts that just print out flags. Well, if you don't have a shell, your thing doesn't work. Or does it really work on any other machine than the one you're currently on? And the answer is probably not. Um, but suppose you, you have these things, okay, you have your dependency systems, might there be side effects of using it? So here is a, uh, one of the flags for, for the new step, uh, which is like a um, re-implementation of the Objective-C parts of Apple. Um, and they have their own config uh, program, and, and here you can get the debug flags. Uh, and I'll give you a few seconds to think about what, that, what the output of this might look like. Right. How many of you got close? 
and, and this is a gift that keeps on giving. It's like it has dash i dot by, by default. It has uh, include directories for things that don't exist in your home directory. Um, the first two are for dependency information, which classes with uh, one that coming from the build system, and so on and so on. And w all gotta have that, and so on and so on. And and uh, yes, <laughs> I hear groaning in the audience. This, this, this is good. All right. Um, so here, the thing that we find again and again is that uh, cooperating is actually hard. If you want to write your own dependency system, you can do that and it works for you, but you are not the target audience of your own dependency system. The people using it are and cooperating with them, that's the hard bit. Um, but it gets even worse than that. Um, so I had a discussion with a fellow at the bar who was a proponent of a certain programming language A. Um, and in language A, it's, it's quite difficult to get pre-built libraries um, because everything is tied to the way their build system and dependency lookup works. And the following uh, exchange of words took place, and this is word for word or exact as, as exact as it can be because I had, had a, a drink or two. But, uh, the person in question said that, okay, this is just the way we'd have to do things. And it's like, well, no, because there's programming language B, which is roughly similar to what you're doing, and they have a system for pre-built libraries. And, and, and you can integrate things with, that are built with different build systems. Um, that's just desperation. Language B has existed for years without any usage, whereas language A is taking over the world. Um, it could be said that they are just being pragmatic. And then for the final uh, re response was, no, they're just desperate. Word for word exact thing. At this point, I, I couldn't think of anything to say. But one of the things which, which we've had lots of talks here uh, at this LCA and so on about the open source uh, community is about cooperation. It's like people come together and they work on, on things to work together but what does it say about the open source community if cooperating with, with people using something other than your favorite tool is seen as an act of desperation? Now, it, could, it could be said that this is just one person speaking and that, that's a reasonable counter argument. But this is one of the th things that, that once you realize that this is a thing, you start seeing it in, in places and, and, and other places where you like, probably don't want to see it. So if I ruined your life, sorry. Um, but enough of that. Um, let's go onwards um, to um, some of the requirements that build systems have. Um, build systems are actually quite special um, in a way that uh, they have requirements that other applications don't. And, and it looks like, let's look at some of them. Um, so a BSD developer uh, made the following comment at some point to me, saying that we can't use Messen now because we didn't already use it five years ago. Now, this seems like strangely backward circular logic thing, but, but th this actually makes perfect sense when you think about it for a while. Uh, and and uh, the reason it, it goes a bit like this. So um, suppose you're doing uh, something like uh, Ubuntu LTS releases, and it, uh, it's uh, supported over several years, and there are new graphics cards that come out, and you need to have support for those in order to keep running. And these come from the Mesa project. Uh, they are developed on in head, I think. Keith, is it correct? They're developed at, at Trunk. Right, and then um, the people responsible for the LTS releases will take that code and then backport that to the old releases and make them run. Um, but uh, build systems packages that are in LTS don't get updates. So the version that was there when it was released is the one that's going to stay there. Because if you do change that, then you get into all sorts of interesting problems. So in theory, uh, the message trunk could only use the message version that was available in the oldest supported LTS that they have. Because if you use newer versions, then you also have to rewrite the build system. And this is, again, a big, big maintenance burden 
on, on, on people doing that work. And, and because of this, um, weirdly, adding new features to a build system makes it less capable of doing the job that it's supposed to do. This is, this is like why auto tools was, was a big thing for a long time, because nothing happened in it. It's, it's the same now as it was 10 years ago, so it's, it kind of worked out OK. Um, but there's, things get even stricter. So in, in BSDs, um, I'm, I hope that I'm, I got this correct. Uh, if there are any BSD people and, and notice errors, please point out. Um, but uh, BSDs have the, the core package set. And they have very strict rules that if you are in the core package set, you're not allowed to build depend on anything that's outside of the core package set. And uh, Python is not in there. And I don't, uh, does anyone know if, if there are any plans to add, add Python to the B, any of the BSDs? Okay, no, no one seems to know, but, but it, probably it's not gonna happen for a while. So then a, a BSD developer also said that, well, we can't use Mesen in BSD until you rewrite it in either Perl or C. Um, just for the record, I'm not gonna do that. If someone else wants to do that, go ahead. Um, but th this, these are like the sort of limitations. So, so BSD can't really use Mesen in their core because of this, uh, which is unfortunate. Um, but, but this is just how things go. And, and then these are the sort of things that when you get deep in the, in the bottom layers of the core, things that you, that you think you knew are actually completely like the opposite. And, and it's strange and, and you can't really rely on anything. <coughs> okay, um, let's, let's talk about users because users are always fun. Um, and specifically how people adopt new tools and technologies. And the thing that I noticed is that um, when you are given a new tool, what people do is that they recreate the old tool exactly. Like all the things that you did using the old tool, you recreate in your new tool because that's like, the assumption is that you have to use it in the same way. And this is not something that people do on purpose. It just seems to be like a, a thing of the human psyche. So as an example, uh, in Meson we have uh, files in, uh, in objects. The, like it's, it's very common that you have your files in one directory and then you do define targets using them in, in a completely different directory. So what we did is that we have file objects that remember where they are, like, like the full path, and you can use them anywhere at all and, it, and the system will automatically calculate what the correct path is. And all the documentation that we have, all the sample code that we have, we always have this form. It's got files and then list the files directly. And they always say, just use this, and then the end result can be used anywhere. And yet, how did people use it? They used it like this. Um, I, I've seen this in tens of projects, and, and always filed bug reports, say, hey, you, don't, you know you don't need to do this. It's like, just, just use it directly. And, and then there's like, oh, well, that's convenient. But, um, this is an interesting psychological thing because if you are used to, to using make, then this makes perfect sense because in make everything is a string. And, and probably you have never experienced a system where, you know, where things are other than strings. So you have a preconceived notion that you need to take care of this problem. Uh, and then only after when you are, you are told that, okay, this is well, actually a thing and you, can, you don't have to take care, do this, and things are worked out for you, there's, ah, okay, well, good. But um, this is, uh, what this is, is, is the problematic for, for new, if you do a new tool of any kind that has a workflow that differs from the old one, this sort of effect is a bit of a problem because if when people write code like this, and then they think that this is how you should use it, they get a bad view of it, even though the, the actual system is more capable than, than how they are using it. So this is an interesting uh, psychological thing. I don't know if there's a name for this, this but if, if someone knows that the, if there's a name for this psychological condition, please let me know. Um, but this, what, <laughs> other, what there is, there is a law, which is 
the useless law of programmers is that the problem with programmers is that once well, you give them the chance, they will start programming. And the, then there's a corollary for this, which goes like this. There is no limit to the amount of work a programmer is willing to do to avoid reading documentation. <laughs> so let's look at an example of this. Um, uh, in Meson, you can, have, uh, you can build projects as sub-projects of other projects. And what we want, went from early on is that you want to isolate the sub-projects from each other and from the master project. Yep. So if you try to grab files directly from a different sub-project, the system will detect that and say, no, you can't do that. You have to use the mechanisms that are in place to do this. Uh, because if you, if you permit this, then you force a specific layout between the a master project and a sub-project or two different sub-projects because they have hard-coded hard, hard paths, then they always have to be in the same orientation relative to each other. And then all, all operations are sandbox, and this is a very nice uh, reliability and flexibility improvement because then you can, because you know that these things are isolated from each other. Right, so what did people do? Well, um, whenever you have a restriction, some people dislike that. And then they really want to do their own thing. So they went through the source code and found a bug in the isolation code where you could construct paths that would actually pass through this thing and you could grab stuff from somewhere else. And then they exploited that and they grabbed files directly. Uh, and then we found this bug and we fixed it and then they complained. It's like, how dare you? I, I, I relied on this to, to work and you have to keep, keep doing this. It's like, I don't know, when, are there container developers? Do you, do you have the same problem that people want to grab stuff from the other containers and they get annoyed when you can't? I'm guessing, yes. Um, and this is a, a recurring thing. Every single time we have tried to enforce anything for consistency, there have been people who complain about it usually quite loudly. Um, but uh, and this, this leads into the, the usability dilemma of, of software development in general, is that uh, short-term usability comes from the fact that you allow people to solve their own problems. And long-term usability comes from preventing people from solving their own problems. It's like you have t tools and sol solutions and you have people use them and then they can uh, use their energy on, on something more efficient rather than everyone always reinventing everything. But um, the, the hacker mentality favors the first one. It's like, ooh, I can fix my own things. And that, it, it's a very alluring thing and people want that power. And, when, and, and even further is that once you permit something, it's really difficult to then take it away. So, so like software design is a very um, tightrope walking of like what are the things that you permit, which are the things that you don't permit, and, and how you go about doing that so that um, you drive people towards working on solving the problems once and then using that instead of every single project running off in its own direction. <coughs> okay. Um, but let's look at something else. So um, when you have users, you get feedback. Uh, and one of the feedback that we got, uh, some, every now and then people send me private emails where they write, I have this problem with Mesen, could you please tell me how to fix this? And I always reply to them saying, that, I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't do email uh, personal service, just open, open a puck or come to the, the IRC channel to discuss. And then uh, I got this uh, answer. Uh, which is, that is very sad, but I expected to hear something like that one day, even from the open source community. Good luck with such the nice attitude. Um, I, I don't like the, the Gmail instant replies usually, but in this case, it's awesome because it says, very sad indeed. <laughs> I, I was tempted to press that just, just for the, that one, but, but then I didn't. Um, right. Okay, so the time is, time is running. So let's look at um, the future a bit. So what is the biggest problem like, in, in free software development and, and builds and so on in the future? Um, well, one of the things which we could say is that it's mixing of, of programming languages and dependencies. 
Um, the old way was that everything is in C, and uh, using C with C is quite easy. You just put things together. Now, what's, what seems to be happening is that people are getting more and more disillusioned by C, and then they are moving on to other languages, uh, C++, D, Rust, Nim, Zig, your favorite here, Swift, and so on. And what probably will happen is that the, the, the base of, of software, will, it's going to get like, fragmented, and you have different parts implemented in different languages. Um, then, then there's the problem, because um, every single programming language that you invent nowadays has its own build system and their own dependency manager. And they are all optimized for the, the very common case of building only your own thing, <coughs> Uh, when you use some C libs from the library, but that's it. And, and for this use case, if these are the things that you want to do, it works actually quite nicely. Uh, and they don't work quite as well in any other case. Um, one of the original design points of Meson was that um, it should mi support mixing of arbitrary languages, and also that it should be re-implementable. Um, so if there are people who want to write their own programming language, uh, like a, like a recommendation is that when you, when you have to design your new own build system and your own dependency manager, um, consider taking the, the Meson uh, definition and just write your own implementation from that. Could use that to bootstrap your thing, and then when, you're, if, if, when your thing is ready or, or has wider use, you can uh, submit support to upstream Meson and then your programming language will work with all the other programming languages that Meson currently supports, which is kind of nice. Um, uh, the existing languages could also do that. Um, it's kind of like the naive uh, dream that this would happen. Um, the pessimist in me says that it won't happen. Um, they're probably a bit too entrenched to their existing tooling, and they don't want to give it up. So it's like... It doesn't look very good, but, but um, the, the big problem is that if you, have, uh, if you want to have multiple build systems in the same build directory at the same time, that doesn't work. It works for simple use cases, and it's a bit inefficient, but if you want to make it act actually scalable and reliable and all those th sorts of things, it's not really possible. And this is an hour's talk on its own. Or like if, you, if you wanted to do really reliable, it would get really, really complicated. Uh, so everything is terrible, and we should just give up. Maybe. Um, but earlier in the talk, there was um, the mention that, that um, a bad solution will prevent a good solution from coming out. So, so oops. Is we have these tools like um, R pads and all the li uh, load library pads and custom prefix and all that uh, to to build uh, things with dependencies on your own and, and have them work uh, independent of the one that's on your system. So, what if all of these were, they are the bad solution? And so, uh, what what would a better solution look like? Um, we don't, as far as I know, we don't have one yet, but there are things that, you could, that could be it. Uh, and Flatpak is one of the examples of this. Um, a Flatpak builder has a, a staged build concept, which is a bit similar to how, how Docker works, uh, in that you install your dependencies one by one, and you have a sandboxed uh, environment. So it looks like you're installing to the system, which we know that works, because that's how Linux systems work, but the, the kernel will, will, will make it so that it looks like you're installing in your own thing, but it's just over here by the side. And the way Flatpak specifically works is that when you run your application, all the dependency stuff comes from your own bundle, but you can see, see the file system as if you were the user. So you can see the user home directory, all that sort of thing. And, and it, it actually works pretty nice. Um, because then you can, if you have something like package config, where you have a, a build system independent way of getting dependencies, then you can mix languages and build systems in completely arbitrary ways. Because you just install them one by one, and they install, install the system, and then they are usable out of the box. And they don't need to know about how all the other things are built. 
and, and with kernel file system isolation, it's, it's quite nice and convenient. Um, I was, I'm just given the 10 minute sign, so, so closing up. Um, there are things uh, we could use help with. Again, if, if you are a Python hacker or, or other things, all things are, are, are needed, usual features, bug features, and so on. Um, but one of the things is that um, we have a dependency management system of ourselves because we've got to have that. It's called the RAPDB. Um, it's a bit understaffed at the moment, so if there are people who want to work on that, it would be great. Uh, either it's just contributing new uh, wraps, which are new, like write the build system for a project which doesn't use Meson, and then submit that, and then, then the system will combine them and you can build them transparently. Uh, or you can view uh, things that are there. Uh, and even better, work on web service reliability. Um, currently, the RAPDB is down. Uh, and the reason that the server hasn't been restarted is that it has apparently vanished. And the wonders of cloud technology. So um, our, our goal is to get it uh, like proper uh, reliability and so on. Um, so if you have that or, or if you are a company and you want, want to give us, uh, provide hosting for the thing, uh, please come talk to us. And we'd like to know about that. OK. Uh, so in conclusion, um, Let's talk about the year 2000. So we have gotten many things since then, it's like LLVM and Android and all these massive big projects which, have, which didn't exist at the time and then have been built from scratch. And they are all much more difficult to write than a build system. Uh, and yet build systems haven't changed all that much since, since the year 2000. Uh, at least not as much as you would ex expect. And why is that? And, it, and maybe it's because a writing build system is hard, uh, but not as hard as it's difficult. It's hard as it's tedious. And, and people are drawn to problems that are hard as it's difficult, but not really so much to things that are hard and tedious. And this is um, a problem with, with open source development, especially volunteer one, because for companies, you pay people to do the tedious work. But for open source development, this is a big problem. It's like, how do you get? people to contribute in, in projects that are, are useful and needed, but which are kind of tedious to work on. Um, maybe you find some crazy weirdo from Finland to do that for you, but it's like not a really scalable solution. Um, that's, the, that's all I had. Uh, I will take questions, and the first four people to ask me a question will get one of these, which is a mess and mug. Only 72 have made made. So this is your only chance of getting one. And, and this is rare collectible, at least $10 on eBay. Go for it. Come on down. If no one asks a question, I will. And I'm pretty new. new. Is it considered to build the kernel with Messon? OK, so the question is, is can you build a kernel? Um, not, so you can't do it now. Um, the, the problem with compiling the kernel is not so much in the compilation itself. It's the kconvig system. And uh, we do have support for that. So you can, you, if you do your kconvig, you can read the, the configuration in, and then you do your build system thing there. So, so if someone were to do the work, you could do that. Um, and it would be interesting. Uh, but the kernel is very special in that it does a very specific thing, and it doesn't need to cooperate with anything else. So the thing that they have might be the smart thing to do, because there's a lot of work involved in changing it. But that being said, if someone wants to do them, like is interested in, in changing it, I'll be happy to help you in all the ways that I can. Uh, and, but, but if you have a very specific thing that you're doing, and you have a thing that works, Maybe just stick with it. Thank you. And come get your thing. Cheers. Do you encourage, do you encourage to um, copy lib the Mason into the project, or do you encourage that it already exists on the system a bit like CMake? Which way? I mean, WAF does the, you right. should copy it into the project. That's what Samba does. No. So, so we recommend that you use the system one uh, and install it from PyPI if it's on the system. And how do you cope with the, I mean, you, you, 
you alluded to issues with the built, the, you know, you've got an ancient one. We're constantly having to fix bugs in WAF in, um, in order to fit, have Samba's build improve. How do you cope with that long round trip problem? Um, we haven't really had that. Um, it, or like people haven't filed bugs to us saying that this is a problem. So somehow how they're doing whatever it is that how their system works, they they cope with it somehow. But you would Samba would probably have the same problem if you need to run on the old old things and no, no. So so we just we we have a full copy of WAF in our uh, right. in our third party directory. Right. Uh, we update it to as we as new releases come out, but the person who's installed running running a Samba build has the current WAF um, already you know, okay. in our tree. Okay. Uh, the one that we tested with and we built with. Right. So if you want to ship your own version of Meson with the thing, you can do that. Okay. It works. You can just run it from whatever checkout you want. Have if it works for you, go for it. Okay. Okay. Come, come get your. So, on the BSD five-year program, five-year problem you mentioned, in enterprise distros we have a slightly different, yet similar problem in that we have some projects using Mason that want to have the latest and greatest features all the time, and yet in our stable enterprise distro we might have a two-year-old version of Mason without that feature. Do you think that there's anything we can do to kind of reconcile those two ideas? Um, well, let me tell you a story of an imaginary uh, Linux distribution that shall not be named. Uh, System D adopted Mason, and uh, it's used on this thing that should not be mentioned by name, distro, which is something, something, six. And Python 3 is not in the uh, default install for that. It's only in the extra thing. And things in the core are not allowed to build depend on things that are outside of the core. Same thing as with BSD. And, it, and yet System D manages to do that because somehow magically Python 3 appears when you need to build system D and then it goes away. So usually people can get around these things, but this, this is a, like a known problem. It's like if you have a core infrastructure thing and you need to run on all things, this is a big problem and I don't really have a good solution for this. Okay, one last mug, who wants? Thank you. Oh, there you go. Hey, uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, I have a question about um, integration with other build systems. Right. In, um, in Android, uh, the AOSP project, they recently switched to a new build system called Blueprint. And uh, problematically, uh, some of the open source projects used, uh, like Mesa, for example, they're now Mason based, which is really nice but there's no good way of integrating the two. Like you're forced to use Android Blueprint to uh, yeah, basically build the software inside of uh, Android, but uh, you can't really reconcile that with Mason being used in, in, in the Mesa project, for example. Uh, what's the story? Is there a solution to that kind of problem? Well, I haven't looked into Android all that much, but um, it's their distro, they make the call, they say this is how you do things, and then we just have to cope and, and try to work. From, as, from what I can tell from memory is that there, is, they, there was interest by the Mesa folk that you could have the list of files in some special way so that you could read it both from the Android Blueprint one and the, the Mesa file. Um, which is something that we could do. So then, then you would have the list of files in one location and it would be easier. Um, but if your, if your operating system vendor insists on doing things, then you have to do those things. So, sorry. Thanks. Thank you. We are out of time. Thank you, Yussi. Thank you.